Welcome. This is Tommy Rook. Welcome to the monthly Truck Stop webinar presented each second Thursday of each month at 2 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. These webinars are presented as an industry update and information for members of the foundation and other interesting people. They do not qualify for state CE credit. We do have programs that do qualify for state CE credit. They are presenting the first and the third Tuesday of each month, again at 2 p.m. If you are interested in state CE credit, contact our office and we'll let you know uh, how to uh, meet those requirements through our webinars that we present on a monthly basis. If you have any questions during this period of time, type them in the chat window and we'll attempt to ask them as we go along. Or if we do not have time to uh, answer them, we will uh, email the answer uh, by, uh, e we will email after the webinar, we'll email the answers to you. And if it's a question that's general to everybody, we will share that to information with everybody. We'll obviously take uh, any personal names out of it. Also, every now and then we have audio or other problems. Uh, either type in the chat window if you have it or call our office at 800-741-4084 and we will try to resolve any of those problems. I have and we have had a long-term relationship with Central Analysis Bureau. We have been involved with them for a lot of years. We have gotten together with them because they provide information that is used uh, often by our, or most of our insurance carriers in this marketplace to uh, help them uh, analyze the risk they're going to write as well as the retail agents. And so to that end, we're going to uh, explore information cause, uh, with Central Analysis Bureau and their title is Looking Beyond the Colors. I'm asking Rich Brim, our good friend, to kind of head this up and so I'm going to turn it over to Rich. Rich, you're up. Good morning, Rich Bren from sunny Arizona saying good morning to the West Coast and good afternoon to the rest of the country. We're having a, a great opportunity here to broaden our perspective with our friends from the Central Analysis Bureau. I was able to personally meet these two and learn from them during a time that I lived out in Raleigh, North Carolina and worked for a motor carrier insurance provider. So the Central Analysis Bureau, again, uh, helped me quite a bit in that role and they've been helping those of us that are underwriters as well as uh, known to the trucking industry in providing commercial insurance you know support for well over 75 years today cab as as we're abbreviating it central analysis bureau or cab is widely used to help us in the insurance side of this to understand the operations and the safety scores of motor carriers and the risks that are involved so the tools uh, that they provide us are used by many different companies including insurance companies, their agents, the brokers, and others. So CAB is an exclusive provider for some unique tools like the Chameleon Detector, Vital which is a vehicle inspection tracker and locator, also a product known as Sales which is an online search engine for targeted leads of motor carriers. So today joining us from CAB is Shui Yankelowitz, the Chief Operating Officer and Tiana Kane, Assistant Vice President of Business Development at CAP. Shui and Tiana are excited to have this opportunity to, to join us again and to help broaden our understanding about the uh, products provided because there's such a broad uh, group of attendees today that are participating. So this is of great value, great importance as we're all trying to dig deeper into this information that's provided by CAP. So their combined experience is what gives credence to the company's motto, CAB is more than just data. And today we're going to look beyond colors and symbols and, and hope to understand really what's, what's occurring, what's going on with these motor carriers that we're reviewing. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to turn it over to Tiana and Shui. And uh, those of you sitting in your office, you can, you can interact, you can applaud at this time. So go ahead and take it, Tiana. Thank you so much, Rich. Thank you, Tommy. We really do appreciate you guys having us, and we'd like to thank the Foundation for allowing us to be a part of your monthly webinars. We were very excited when Tommy asked us to come and do this session. We're excited because this is a slightly different format than what we typically do. So for those of you who are listening today, and you are regular attendees to the training sessions that we offer for CAB, this is going to be a slightly different format because our intent today is not to walk you through the website and show you how to use it. 
On the contrary, what we're going to do is go through a few slides, which is actually something a little bit new to Shui and I. You'll have to forgive us if we're a bit clunky in this. We're used to uh, just kind of free-forming through our website. But really what we want to focus on today is giving you guys a different perspective and looking into the information and not settling when you just log into the website not settling on <clears throat> looking at just one thing or seeing one icon and letting that stop you from the process. Now, I'm going to hit on something. I'm going to go ahead and, and, and address the white elephant in the room. We've got a broad audience on here, and I know that some of you listening in today are retail agents. And I have, uh, Tommy's been kind enough to ask Shuey and I to come out and speak at some of his different sessions. And I know from past experience that some of, re some of the retailers in this industry have not had the best taste in their mouth about CAB. You don't have to pretend that we all don't know this. We do know this. We know that, that hearing things like the CAB report says has added an extra dimension of frustration to your day-to-day -day job, especially those of you who do not have access to CAB. I just want to address that really quickly because I think it's important for us to put that behind us so we can actually move forward with today's session. One of the things that, in actually, uh, I'm going to pick on John Love here for just a moment. We were actually, Shui and I were actually speaking at one of Tommy's sessions, and a retail agent stood up and said that very thing. You guys have made my job so much more complex. And John Love stood up and said something very, very truthful and very enlightening. He said, no, CAB hasn't changed anything. The questions that underwriters ask are the same questions they've always asked. The difference is this information is now compiled in one location for them. So now you can actually get the answers you need in a much more convenient package. And I want to remind you guys that we really, we've only changed the face of the game in that we have made it more convenient and we're providing the information that underwriters have always wanted to know. I, for those of you that know me, you know I've been around the industry for a long time. I was an underwriter for many years before joining CAB. And the questions that, that I asked as an underwriter are the same questions that the CAB report answers. And so really I just want to remind everybody today that, that CAB and our report, if there's one thing you get out of today's session, we are not out there trying to tell you who is good and who is bad. That is not our job at CAB, nor is it something we even ascribe to. What we do want to do is give you the information you need to make an educated decision about a motor carrier. I want to stress that point because that is something that is so often overlooked and so often misunderstood when you look at a CAB report. So I'm just going to switch here to the next slide and we'll, talk, we'll, we'll address that point. Again, CAB is not out there trying to tell you who's good and who's bad. And as we go through the information we provide in the report today, both Shui and I are going to continue to address the different icons, the information that shows up to remind you that none of these icons are intended to say this is a bad carrier. Rather, this is all information that is intended to help you paint an entire picture of a motor carrier and then decide whether or not a motor carrier meets the underwriting criteria or does not meet the underwriting criteria. And then if it does meet the criteria, what price you should price it for. Now, addressing retail agents that, that would look at this information, having access to CAB before you submit a quote will save you a world of trouble because you can vet through these accounts, you can anticipate what types of questions your underwriters are going to have, you can answer those questions before they even ask them, and you can also understand the different aspects of these risks that you may want to perhaps use a different carrier for. And what I mean by that is as you go through the account, you realize, oh, okay, this isn't necessarily going to be this company's appetite, but this will be better suited for this company's appetite. And I'm, I'm not doing a sales pitch. I just want to remind you, we do have a program for agents that is specifically designed to give you that ability to vet through this before you send it to a company. So I want to remind you that we're here to work with you uh, from an underwriting perspective, from a retail agency perspective, to help make this process of gathering information on a motor carrier much more fluent, much more efficient, and much easier all the way down the line. That's really our mission. And uh, Shui has grown up, he's had the privilege of working with our CEO and our, pre our president, who are both defense attorneys. He's heard, heard that information. I come from the underwriting side, so we're passionate about giving you information that you can use to research further when understanding a motor carrier. 
So let's talk about the CAB report. And, and I have heard so many of uh, retail agents refer to it as the CAB report. So let's get the snark out of our voice a little bit and understand really what our purpose is and then how we go beyond just looking at icons and colors to really digging into the operations of a motor carrier. So again, the CAB report is a tool designed to assist the insurance industry to know the insured. So you may or may not have heard our motto, know your insured. That was our primary purpose in, in designing the CAB report. Shuey came along uh, many years ago and, and thought of the idea, and then him and I worked together, and then Shuey partnered with many other users in the industry to build what you see today as the CAB report. Utilizing the data and analysis in the report allows for a deeper understanding of the operations of a motor carrier to facilitate the proper coverage for the proper premium for the right insurer. And so I kind of, in my introduction, hit those points, but I want to drive that home again. We look at the CAB report as pieces of a puzzle, and each piece of that information you piece together to paint an entire picture, along with all the other information that you receive on a motor carrier. And we want to drive home the point that nothing in this report should be a stopping point unless, of course, you guys have, or your carrier, your company has a hard, fast rule, if this condition exists, you know, no longer, you know, it, it's no longer eligible. Uh, unless that exists, though, we would really encourage you to take the time to go through this. Now, as a side note, the information in the CAB report can be somewhat overwhelming only because there is so much there, which is why we are so focused and we're happy to have opportunities like the opportunity we have today to partner with uh, the, the Motor Carrier Foundation and other companies, which is why we stress education, because we don't want you to get into the CAB report and become overwhelmed by the information there. We really want to break it down for you so you understand where it is and understand the flow and navigation. If you feel yourself overwhelmed with the information or the flow and navigation, I would encourage you to reach out to us and let us know how we can help you better understand the information in the report, because that's going to be the first key to really getting beyond the colors, looking beyond the colors in the CAB report. So our next slide, we want to talk about the alerts. Now we have lots of different sections in the report, and we're going to cover some of those in today's session. But one of the main sections that gets a lot of our users into trouble, and when I say into trouble, they, they tend to look at it and get, uh, we'll call it paral analysis paralysis, is the alert section. So let's talk about what, what type of information we have in the alerts, why we have the alert section, and then how you can use that to make a better decision about a motor carrier. Alerts allow a subscriber, so a subscriber would be a user of CAB, to define targeted areas of concern which should be further investigated during the underwriting process. Okay, so what we're what we're doing is we're we're giving you potential issues. And I want to stress that first word of what I said, potential, okay? Nothing in the alert section should should be anything more than another tool for you to dig in and understand what's occurring on this motor carrier's account. <clears throat> I'll give you an example. I just got an email a few minutes ago from a broker. They were looking up an account, and the account was issued an out-of-service order, new entrant revoked. So that was the reason they were issued out-of-service as a new entrant. Now, for most companies, they say, we're not going to write a carrier that has been issued an out-of-service order. And that's fair enough. That's a, it's a, a perfectly legitimate reason not to write a carrier. However, there was a comma at the end of that sentence. And the comma said, rescinded on 5-13-2015. So the, the out-of-service order had been rescinded yesterday, and so the agent was checking with me, or the broker was checking with me to say, what does that mean? So again, it showed up in the alert section, but if you read the entire alert, you would see that the motor carrier was no longer out of service, that that had been rescinded. So again, that's why it's really important to read through the alerts, to take that information in the context of the entire account, and not get stuck or hung up on one particular aspect. Alerts can assist an insurer in avoiding a risk outside of the company's appetite. So again, it's, it's intended to be an assist, not necessarily a hard, fast stop. And alerts are not necessarily an indication of a problem. Actually, um, we, we have an alert that is commonly misunderstood as a problem. And Shui, I'm going to ask you to chime in here on this one. There's an alert that says, this motor carrier does not have any uh, active operating authority. No filing should be issued until their authority is active. So, Shui, this is one that's commonly misunderstood. What would you say to that particular situation? 
<clears throat> in that case, it's really more targeted at the insurance company specifically because the filings present a very high level of exposure that they want to avoid. We're just trying to allow them to understand the fact that this is not a carrier that, as it stands as of today, requires a filing to be issued. Even if they have an MC number, because they do not have active operating authority, unless they've reapplied to have that authority instated or reinstated, there is no need to issue a filing, and a filing should not be issued. It's absolutely not a problem whatsoever unless this motor carrier is holding itself out as a carrier that does need authority, in which case, uh, if proof of a reapplication is provided, the filing should be issued. So it's not really there to say that this is a bad guy, just saying don't issue the filing because filings are very tricky and very, very, uh, it gets the insurance companies very nervous because of the liability and exposure it creates. So therefore, uh, it's just a warning there to let them know, don't issue it unless you're sure that you absolutely need it in this case, which means that they should ask for proof that everything was corrected. Sushi, I want to add one thing to this. I apologize. To, but here. And that's because a exemptaller does not have to have a filing. So even though they don't have their MC authority anymore, they can still haul exempt commodities as long as they got the DOT number. That's the difference in there. And a lot of people don't understand that that, that kind of a, a difference. And I think you, you cleared it up. I just want to add those two cents because we didn't talk about, yes, you can still operate as an exempt hauler even though you don't have a, a 91X filing. Exactly, and that was my exact point. Alerts are not necessarily an indication of a problem, which is why I wanted to stress this point as we talk through today. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flash up on the screen what our alert section actually looks like. So this is just a screenshot. You may not be very clear. Anybody who's ever seen a CAB report knows what this section looks like. But just keep in mind that we put these in here just to raise your awareness of potential issues that may exist but it is not necessarily an indication that something is wrong. Now, as a side note, and I need to stress this very clearly, this section of the report is customized by each insurance company. So if you are an MGA or a broker that has access for multiple insurance companies, this is why it's really important for you to be logged into your correct insurance carrier when you're using CAB, because many of our clients have chosen to customize this section to only include the alerts that are relevant to their book of business, and in which case they do want you to pay attention to those and to go through those. Uh, another example of one of the alerts, and Shui, I'll let you chime in and, just, and talk about this a little bit more, would be this one that says a total of 33 vehicles were used by other entities. Would you like to talk about what information that would display and what information that could potentially tell you about a motor carrier? You know, shared, shared units, everyone, I mean, almost any trucking company is going to have some sort of shared units because uh, not everybody's buying a brand new truck. So if you buy it from somebody else who used to drive that truck and that truck was inspected, then it's going to exist under somebody else's record as well. The only time that shared unit information is relevant or important or critical is when you see an interchange of vehicles uh, during the lifetime of a policy possibly and where it goes back and forth meaning two different carriers are using the same vehicle at a time, it may be an indication of the fact that they use owner operators. It may be an indication of the fact that um, they have multiple companies or multiple uh, operations that they run. So it's, Or it could be something that's more problematic. We don't know what it is, and we're not here to say what it is. We're just here to bring it to light, as Tiana said, to give you an insight into which vehicles they were and to allow you to drill into it to see um, which companies they were that were using those vehicles. By putting it together and presenting it this way, it just gives the individual who's looking at the report the ability to drill in, take a quick look, and see if there's any questions that need to be raised. As Tiana said, the questions have been those questions always. And one of the standard questions is, are you related to, affiliated with any other entity that uh, you know we need to be aware of? Because that can affect the nature of the risk. This is just a question. If there is some sort of interchange of vehicles, are you running owner operators? That may be a certain type of operation. Are you related to another company? That also can affect the nature of the risk. Understanding what it means will be clarified when the question is asked and the motor carrier can respond to say, well, this is why I was using vehicles that somebody else used. And that's all, again, it's intended for. Thank you. Rich Brown, I want, to, I want to chime in on that one, too. There is the reality in today's world with certain types of our carriers that are doing short-term rentals. And so we have the equipment of somebody else's in our possession, 
And so here again, that's a flag of higher to non-owned exposures that you could be facing on liability, physical damage, and even your cargo. So as an agent, if that shows up, there's an opportunity to sell some more insurance. As an underwriter, there is a definite concern that something is running under your MC and you have a exposure to it and are you collecting the premium but you know it should it can be addressed and then the other thing that it may demonstrate to us is that the assumption is I rolled it off the lot and it was road ready and if you're getting vehicle maintenance dings on rental equipment you may want to look at your provider and so again agents trying to help your customer uh, dig behind these numbers. What's it telling me, and how can I use this? Yeah, thank you, Rich and Shui. Those are both um, great pieces of input. And I just want to remind everybody that, again, from a retail agent perspective, look at this alert section before you send in a quote to your underwriter. If there are things on here that are going to raise red flags, get the answers to the questions before they go to your underwriter. And I know for, as an underwriter, as you're sitting here looking at this information, you guys are saying, yes, please, because all you do then is you have to look at it, go back and ask the questions, and so we can kind of save ourselves this, this figure eight cycle that happens back and forth between underwriters and agents by simply addressing some of these questions. I won't spend too much more time on the alert section because we have a lot more to go through today, but just a reminder, some of the big things that are going to come up from alerts that you're going to want to pay attention attention to. Inspected with hazardous materials, but no hazardous authority. So you're not indicated as a hazardous materials hauler, <clears throat> but a DOT officer has indicated hazardous materials have been present during an inspection. Another big one, and this one actually shows up in this list, is that they're operating the derived power unit count is X many units higher than what is reported on the MCS 150. Again, if this is a lot of higher car non-owned exposure, that number may be artificially high because of that. But if your motor carrier is not keeping their MCS-150 updated with the current number of units they're operating, that is going to create an alert showing that more vehicles are being operated than what are actually reported. Severe violations over the past 36 months, that's a unique alert that we've created that will summarize all of the serious violations or severe violations, a category we've created at CAB over the past 36 months. That's going to contain an additional 12 months worth of data that is not on the SMS website. So again, we have, we, we have created this report specifically for the insurance industry. And uh, then the other thing we're going to show in the alert section are any of those shared I information. So if we find matching addresses, phone numbers, email addresses, et cetera, underwriters are generally always going to ask about those other entities that are associated. So if you can get that information beforehand, that'll save you a lot of heartache. And I, I believe many of the underwriters on the line are saying yes. If you can include that in your submission and we don't have to pull it up and find it, find out for the first time when we're looking at CAB, that'll make the communication process more efficient all the way around. So now the next slide we're going to cover, and give me one second here to get that changed, is understanding the analysis. So what we do at CAB is more than just say, here's their scores, here's their information. We actually break it down for you in over a period of time. And I cannot stress how this is such an important aspect of looking at the information in the CAB report. And the reason for that is when you're looking at certain things like out-of-service percentages or the basic scores or the ISS score, what I find a lot of users do is they, they take a look at that one particular score and they make a lot of assumptions based on a score that changes every month. So every month the ISS score is recalculated. Every month the basic scores are recalculated. Every month the out-of-service percentages are recalculated. And it's really easy to take a look at today's scores and make an assumption that that is how the motor carrier has performed over a period of time. And as we get into the basic scores, I'm going to tell you guys a story about an account that I looked at yesterday with an agent, a retail agent out of Texas. And it was amusing as we looked through this how one inspection changed their entire future. And, or I should say past, it's been, but that one inspection going forward changed their, their score for several months. And I want to stress as you're going through this that we've created a lot of this analysis and a lot of these charts to give you a timeline perspective, a breakdown, a complete a com complete review of a motor carrier so you don't get lost in just one score. And, and I really want to stress that point today. And that's why we came up with the title, Looking Beyond the Colors, because that's really our intent is to get you to see that there's nothing in the report we give you that's intended to say good or bad. Rather, paint an entire picture of the carrier. 
So the unique and proprietary charts and graphs provide an analysis of relevant trends in out-of-service violations, basic scores, the CAB ISS score, financial security, and radius of operations. Trends allow an insurer to understand how a motor carrier's operations impact risk assessment. And that's a fancy way of saying, hey, how are they operating over a period of time, and how is that likely to impact how this motor carrier performs? So the first slide that I'm going to bring up here is the out-of-service trend. And what this is, is this is our way of trending for you over a period of time, how the motor carrier's inspection, violation, and out-of-service percentages have changed. And generally speaking, when you're looking at a carrier, and this, this particular account that I used these snapshots from is actually a chameleon carrier. This is one of the ones where we did our research and found out that they were truly hiding who they were. This is kind of a common graph that you'll see for a chameleon carrier because their poor operations catch up with them very quickly. And that's kind of what we see here. But I would encourage you as you look at the out-of-service percentages, one of the questions I'm frequently asked is, what does out-of-service even mean? So Shui, since you're the expert on this, I'm going to turn that over to you and say, what does out-of-service even mean? And what does this trend show us when you're looking at it? So there's, you know, there's a lot of, the, the term out of service is used in different contexts, so it's important to understand the nature of the context. You know, you can have an out of service motor carrier, like Tiana referenced earlier, that's not the same thing as a motor carrier that actually shut down. What we're talking about over here is their out of service trends, specifically with regard to inspections. Um, so an inspection takes place, and during the inspection, there may be one or more, uh, there may be zero or more violations. Um, and of those violations, if there are any violations, the violation may or may not be uh, severe enough to warrant the motor carrier being taken out of service. And it could be the result of vehicle maintenance issues. It could be a result of the driver issues. It could be, you know, the driver's driving over hours, his logs are falsified, or, or, or maybe the brakes are no good. There's lots of different violations that can be cited. And every single violation um, can also be elevated to a level of out of service, which would mean that this motor carrier cannot go back in to, on the road, well, at least not the motor car, excuse me, the truck can't be, you know, let out of this way station or back on the road until that specific issue is addressed and corrected. So um, the, the out-of-service is really designed around the individual inspections. And then we're giving you two graphs over here just to give you two different pieces of insight because on, on any single inspection, the inspection could be out-of-service if any violations were out-of-service violations. But to know how many violations were cited and how many of those were out of service gives you a different perspective. So what we're doing is breaking it down two different ways, just to look at their total overall inspections. And of their overall inspections, how many of them resulted in at least one out of service violation, which meant the, the, the inspection as a result was taken out of service. That's also what's known as their out of service percentage. Many people are familiar with SAFER's out of service scores. The out of service score that's presented over there is the number of inspections divided and uh, as it compares to the number of out of service inspections. It's broken down on safer by vehicle, driver, and hazmat. Here we're just showing you overall rather than breaking it down. On the right side, the right one you're looking at the violation history is showing you the total number of violations that they had cited. And you can see whether or not they have a consistent number, average number of inspections as it as it relates to the inspections. Um, average number of violations, excuse me, as it relates to the inspections. And then within that scope and within that context, what percentage of their violations are actually being cited as severe enough to result in them being taken out of service? So, Shui, let me ask you this question. If I have one truck and I have one violation, or excuse me, one inspection, and that one inspection put me out of service, what is my out of service percent going to be? In that case, it's going to be 100%. So that's why in the alerts, when Tiana was showing you the alerts before, there was an alert there about the out of service percentage. For those of you that go to Safer and, and take a look at the out of service scores that people were looking at for, for, for so long before, you know, SMS became much more popular. It's a very dangerous thing to do that without knowing the full scope because, as Tiana just said, one carrier, a carrier who has one power unit, that one power unit had one inspection, and that one inspection resulted in them being taken out of service is going to have a 100% out of service ratio. So by looking at the numbers, we'll give you an idea of whether or not it's even fair to hold that against the motor carrier. Um, if they were inspected one time and just it was a bad a day, you know, that's, that's valid enough, and 100% out of service and the whole thing being red would not necessarily mean that they're a bad guy. It just means that that one time that they were inspected. So again, looking at the colors here is good. Look at the numbers even more. Look at to see how far up they're going. You've got a decent number of inspections here, so this is a pretty good graph 
and and that's but you can see that right off the ground they started running they had they went straight up to a 35 percent you know one out of every three of their inspections were being result uh, were, were being resulting were resulting in them being taken out of service so that's a pretty high percentage uh, coming off the bat and looking at a carrier like this I would say that this is legitimate analysis if you were dealing with a smaller carrier then you have to take it into context Thank you, Shui, and that was exactly, that's exactly the point we want to drive home when you're looking at the out-of-service information. This is important, to be, and to Shui's point, if, if a vehicle or a driver is found to be so grotesquely out of compliance with a federal regulation that they need to be placed out of service, you need to consider that as a part of your underwriting process. But you also need to take it in context with how large of a fleet it is, how many inspections they've had, and get a full picture, which is why we created this particular analysis, to break it down for you over a period of time. Now, in a perfect world, ideally, you see downward trends or lowly maintained trends. Obviously, not every account we look at is from Kansas, and I'm saying that kind of uh, at you know, uh, Wizard of Oz, you know, we all want to be Dorothy and Toto. But what I'm saying to you is that you really do have to make sure that you look at this and keep it in context with the entire risk. So the other type of analysis that we provide is the area of operations. Now, one of the things that we recently introduced, and if you are a user of CAB and you have not yet seen the date filters on the map, I cannot stress for you enough how important that really is. I was an underwriter for a long time. Many of you listening on the line have run into this scenario many times. And if we had a show of hands, I think everybody would be able to raise their hand and say, how many of you have ever heard the line, I used to go long haul, now I'm local, or I used to be local, now I'm going long haul? And that's where the date filters that we've provided come in really handy. And so when you go into our site, not only is this going to break down for you where the motor carrier has been inspected, and I want to stress this next point very quickly. The difference between the radius information that CAB provides and looking at an IFTA is that the radius information we provide is based on what a motor, where a motor carrier has been inspected. So it is not information reported by the motor carrier versus looking at something like if there's an application, that's, that is still information reported by the motor carrier. So this is a different source. It's, it's, gonna, it's not going to be as subjective as the information that you typically look at. But having the ability to filter this by date will also give you a picture of where their area of operations have been over different time periods. And we have, we have created our date filters so you can look at it in any time period that you want. You can go back in history and you'll see here up on our screen the second little box that I have here where it says carrier inspection metrics versus currently displaying. On the inspection metrics, that's since the inception of this motor carrier's DOT number, the, the first inspection that they've had, the most recent inspection that they've had, how many inspections they've had, and then the currently displaying, we're going to set it to default to the two prior calendar years and year to date. Now, so, so that's why they're slightly different, but then you can change the filter, and as you change the filter, the currently displaying is going to change to show you what the metrics are for the filter that you've used. And again, the purpose of this is so that way you don't look at this and go, oh, no, you're still long haul, the map is completely covered. Instead, if you want to verify that a carrier has truly changed their area of operations, you can slide the date filter and take a look at the most current inspection information to make sure that it is consistent with our operations. Again, driving home the point that at CAB, we are, we're giving you the tools you need to really do the analysis to understand the area of operations of a motor carrier. Not necessarily just broad brush paint, here's where they've been over the past two years, but you can really fine tune this down to look at their most current area of operations. Now we also have a lot of other radius information breakdown that we offer. I opted not to put that into today's presentation just because of the sheer volume of information we're going to cover today. But some of the other things you may see in the radius information that we help you understand a motor carrier, for those, of, for those insurance companies that have customized their report, you may see the breakdown of inspections by different radius categories. So we allow our different insurance clients to tell us what radius buckets, and then we'll show you what percent of their inspections have occurred in those radius buckets. 
And then some of our insurance clients have also opted to define hot zones. And then in our hot zone analysis, we will break down what percent of their inspections have occurred in those predefined hot zones. And then the bottom of that page, we will show you what percent of their inspections occur in each state. So again, it's just a different way of breaking down the information to give you a complete picture of where the motor carrier's vehicles have been inspected. Now, I know many of you are saying, but it's just those that have been inspected. And so I want to stress that point again. Yes, you are absolutely right. This information is going to be is going to be limited to those vehicles that have been inspected. But if they have been inspected, they will show up on this map. And again, if you're not familiar with CAB, you can click on those trucks, you can drill down, you can see what counties those vehicles have been inspected in, and then you can actually drill into the detailed information. And that's a little bit more than what we're talking about today, but I want to remind you that we give you drill down information at your fingertips when you're looking at this information so you can really dig in and understand the, you know, the true nature of this motor carrier's operations. And you don't just have to look at the map that's defaulted to two, two prior years and year-to-date calendar year, but you can really change this to customize what you see. Now the next slide is an important slide and probably one that's often overlooked, the CAB ISS trend. Now we've added a lot of functionality to this, and I'm not going to cover that today because the purpose of today's session is not to teach you the flow and navigation. But I do want to remind you that if at the very top of the ISS, and I'm going to see if you guys can see my cursor here, you do have the option to change the view and download this information. So you can actually get the entire history of the ISS score as long as they've had one calculated. And then by changing it, the time frames, you can even go back further than the annual that we default it to. But I really want to talk about this because this is another one of these scores that a lot of people see that, that, that ISS score when they first log into the CAB report. And this is the stoplight that first shows up on our general page. And they see a color and they automatically, uh, they automatically stop there and they don't continue to process through the rest of the account. And I want to talk about the ISS score and why that's dangerous. First of all, the ISS score is updated every month. So when you first log into the CAB report and you see that score, keep in mind that that is only this month's score. That does not necessarily reflect how that motor carrier has been performing each month. And that is why we created this particular graph for you so you can see over a period of time. Now I'm going to ask Shui to chime in and talk about the ISS score, what, where the information comes from, how, how often it's updated, and then what the primary drivers are in that ISS score. So when you look at that, you understand why it is important to look at this historical trend. Shui? So the, you know, the ISS, as Tiana said, everyone's fixated on it. it. It was the reason, I think, in my opinion, why uh, a lot of people were focused on it beforehand, you know, when it was public information. Uh, was because it was just that one score that you could kind of use, and it was easy to rely on because uh, just look at this little traffic light. I got a red, yellow, green, pretty easy to work with. And one of the reasons that the DOT pulled it off the public view is because there was a lot of confusion uh, regarding the significance of a high score. Um, in fact, you could have a high score for one of two different reasons. You can have a high score because of safety uh, analysis where you're considered to be high risk, or you can have a high score because the government doesn't have enough data about you and they want to pull you over more frequently to start compiling information. So because of that confusion, they pulled it off. Um, we recreate it using the same methodology. We don't necessarily know the exact date that the FMCSA creates it, so there might be a, a minor uh, shift uh, in the exact uh, point in time because we don't know exactly the date that they do it. But the methodology is identical. And it, where it used to be called the, the ISS D-score, because it was focused on driver-based information, it's now actually called the ISS CSA score because it's related to the CSA and primarily driven by the CSA scores, the SMS scores. Um, a motor carrier's basic scores ultimately will be the driver for it, uh, with the exception of a motor carrier being out of service. If a motor carrier is actually out of service on the day that the ISS score is computed, then it's automatically set to 100, which means that they could be set to 100 and then if it's not recomputed for a month, because we only calculate it once a month, it'll stay at 100, even if that out of service is rescinded. So there's, there's one, one area where it can possibly be, you know, the lag of the data may not be completely in sync with the fact that, uh, you know, they're no longer out of service. Uh, in addition to that, the main drivers for the ISS score are the basic scores. So a carrier with a, uh, that's considered to be severe or high risk, for example, 
four basic scores above the threshold will be elevated to a very high level of the ISS score. A motor carrier whose hours of service is above uh, the threshold will also be, uh, you know, will be given a red ISS score because the DOT considers that to be the most severe. So it, it's different combinations of of the different types of violations. Uh, there are certain violations that the DOT considers to be um, fixable on the road. If it's something that they feel it can be fixed on the road, then they'll and this motor carrier has a propensity to be cited with that specific type of violation, then they may inspect them just to see if that's a problem right now so that's something that can be fixed. So there's different, different, um, different methods involved in calculating it, but predominantly it's focused on the performance of a motor carrier with regard to their basic scores. And then by putting that all together, they're ranked within each of their specific segments that they fall into to give you the final score. But a high score, again, doesn't mean bad, and it also, as Tiana said, it's very, very important to understand it's only computed once a month, and we, we, we CAB typically computes it uh, roughly 10 days after the basic scores are released every month, uh, so that way there's enough time for all the data to be in. Um, it's just important to understand that it's just another score, and really all that score means is that when they drive through a way station, they're going to be prioritized for inspections. That's all it means as far as the FMCSA is concerned. Does it mean that the FMCSA thinks that they're bad? No. It means that the DOT is trying to collect information about them, and maybe it feel, the DOT feels that with this particular motor carrier, especially where it's a high safety score, they may feel that if they were going to be randomly inspecting, rather than make it completely random, at least let's make it targeted for ones that have historically shown that they have problems, but it doesn't mean that they expect to find problems every single time. Thank you, Shui. And again, that's why we wanted to put this trend up here. So that way, as you know, as you look at the score, you can tell, you can check to see if this is a new issue or a recurring issue or a historical issue. And, and in this particular case that I have pulled up, the blue line represents the ISS score. It's just like golf. High score loses. Uh, I jokingly say I wish somebody had told me that when I played golf because I won my very first round of golf by, by having the highest score. Uh, that's not how this works. You want a low score, and if, if that blue line is above the red, that means they have a red score. If it's in between the red and the yellow, that means it's a yellow score, and then below the yellow would be a green, which is pass. And again, looking at it over a period of time will help you get a complete perspective of this motor carrier. And I can't stress that enough. And I'm actually, when we get on to the next slide, going to tell you guys a story why that's really important to look at it, look at the history and not just get stuck on the score today. So we'll go ahead and change slides and get into the basic scores. So yesterday I got a call from a retailer out of Texas and he said to me, Tiana, I've got a really interesting situation, let's take a look at it. So he gave me the DOT number, we opened it, and what was interesting is this motor carrier's vehicle maintenance had gotten over the threshold or was in alert status from January 2015 on, so all the way January, February, March, April. Yet they had not had a single inspection in 2015. And so he said to me, how in the world is this possible? How is it that he's above the threshold in vehicle maintenance starting January of 2015 when he has not had an inspection at all in the year of 20, or no recorded inspections in the year of 2015? Well, what we did is we looked back through the inspection history and we found that this motor carrier had actually had a series of violations at the very end of November in 2014. So I was explaining to him, okay, by the time that inspection was batched up to the FMCSA and then calculated in the basic scores, it didn't show up until January's basic scores. And so that really threw this agent for a loop as we started looking at this. But that is, again, why it's so important to look at the historical perspective of a motor carrier's scores when you are looking at their basic scores or the ISS score or the out-of-service scores. Because, because of the way that the data is batched in monthly processes, processes and then the scores are recalculated each month, it's very easy for something to take a few weeks or even a month or so to show up in the motor carrier's history. And again, that can go for good information as well as bad information. So when we're looking here at these basic scores, you can see that their hours of service has continued to trend in a poor direction. So they're continuing to have a very, you know, very poor issue with their hours of service. And yet with their basic scores on the unsafe driving, we saw a spike and then it came back down. So you can get a lot of information for how the motor carrier has been performing over a period of time.
Now, one of the other things that's often misunderstood is how the basic scores even work. So we, I'm going to turn it over to you just to give a, a basic introduction about how the basic scores work, their relativities versus scores. So that way, when users are looking at this information, they can appreciate what all this means. Well, it's actually interesting. A similar story to, to what you had just mentioned. Somebody called me with a, a question where a motor carrier, uh, they had not had a single inspection in months, yet their score was going up. And then the next month, after climbing higher and higher, uh, it suddenly disappeared. And, and they were trying to figure out how it could be that from one day to the next. One time it was 90, it was like 90, then 95, then 96, 97, 99, and then zero. So what just happened? Um, so I think that you know that's a similar story to what you were referencing, how you have to understand how it works. Here's the, here's the concept. And, and, and I hate the fact that they actually stole the word basic and, and have it mean something, because I could barely use it in a sentence now. So I'll refer to the capital B basic when I'm referring to the basic scores. And basically, with a lowercase b, is how this all works. You have inspections that take place across the country. Um, there's roughly, at this point, I'd say 60 to 70,000 inspections that take place every single week uh, at way stations, roadside, and even some terminals across the country. Um, during these inspections, the motor carrier, the, the truck is inspected if it's, a, if it's a certain type of inspection. The driver may be inspected if it's a certain type of inspection. And um, you know, between all that, they may even inspect the cargo. There's a lot of different components to it, depending on the nature of the type of inspection that will take place. As a result of the inspection, there may or may not be a violation that is cited. What the DOD has done is from a, done a, a, a fantastic analysis of the, you know, an attempt to, to determine the predictability of each individual type of, of violation. What they did is they came up with classes of violations, and that's where you have the, the basic stands for behavioral analysis and safety improvement categories. The categories, uh, four of them are devoted to the drivers. You have the, the driver fitness, the unsafe driving, uh, the hours of service, and the controlled substance. Those are all driver-based inspections and violations. Then you have the vehicle maintenance, um, or hazmat related, where it was the kind of shifted in the middle. It used to be one and then became the other. Um, uh, excuse me, the, there's the vehicle maintenance, which is still vehicle maintenance, and then you have the hazmat, which is not public, the score is not public, used to be cargo related. Uh, there's also a crash indicator, uh, which is completely based on the crash data, also a score which is not public. The way that the scores are computed are by taking a look at each individual inspection, um, determining a score for that particular basic, which is every single violation has a severity weight based on how, within that basic, how likely the DOT has ranked that violation as being severe or a predictor that will lead uh, to a crash. So they may rank one violation, uh, exhaust discharge or, or driving without a seatbelt as less severe than somebody driving with uh, drunk uh, or somebody driving, uh, let's say, a truck that has no brakes. So each, each specific class of violation has a certain severity weight. Then the severity weights are summed up uh, for the total, and, and on top of that, an hour, if it's an out-of-service violation, it may increase the severity weight. The, the, the severity weights are all summed up for that particular basic, and then what happens is they'll add a multiplier, so on, from between the zero to six months, they'll be multiplied by three, from six to 12 months, it'll be multiplied by two, and from 12 to 24 months, it'll be multiplied by one, um, and that formula is used to put it all together, and then what they do is they have a mathematical formula bringing together the fleet sizes and its segments and the number of inspections, assuming they have a minimum number. They check for a qualification, meaning not everybody gets a basic score. If you don't qualify, if you don't have enough inspections or enough inspections and violations, putting that all together, it brings it all into a single number called the measure. And the basic measure is what you would see. Um, it's a confusing number. Not everybody understands what it means. But the basic measure is the number, which is the result of the math mathematical formula. I know this is very technical. But what happens is that everybody is classed into a segment, a specific type of class of motor carrier you are. And, and it's, it's typically divided based on the fleets and fleet sizes and utilization that you have per fleet. So factoring in the mileage, how much you travel, uh, how big your fleet is, putting that all together, putting you into a class, and then looking at your measure and ranking you. So where you fall in that rank will ultimately give you the score. So if you have 99, it means that your measure was in the 99th percentile. And as Tiana said, the top is bad. The 99th percentile was ranked uh, within your class of motor carriers that have been scored and ranked. 
And that's what the basic score is. When we look at the numbers, it's a percentile ranking where you fall with regard to your peers. Looking at those numbers all together will give you that perspective. In my particular case, that example that I started out with, what happened was they had an inspection uh, that was in the uh, 12 to 24 month range. It was slowly but surely creeping out. They had not had any inspections recently. Um, and the reason why it was going up was because even though they had no actual inspections that were taking place, their measure created a fluctuation because your measure doesn't tell you your score. It just tells you what your mathematic formula result is. But when you put that against and compare it to how everybody else performs, that's where you get your score. That's why there was a minor fluctuation. They were still ranking pretty high because they had a really, really bad inspection uh, history that was slowly but surely easing out of their history. By the time they got to the 24 months where it fell off, suddenly they went down to zero because they didn't have enough information to be able to rank them. And that's, I know it's very technical, but it's a summary of how it all works. It's mathematical formulas that create a number, the number is then ranked, and that gives you your basic score. Thank you, Shui. Rich, did you have a comment you wanted to add to this particular segment? Yeah, I just want to comment that it's just that easy, isn't it, Shui? This is uh, this is something that does make our heads spin, and you know the the point is, and I and I love what you guys are going through. You know, you always got to put it in perspective and context, and you, and you guys keep saying that, and I don't know how many people can really embrace it. That's where you know Tommy has had the likes of a Steve Bryan from Vigilo, trying to help us see it's where you run and the things like BLT, brake lights and tires are predominantly going to show up and certain states are going to beat you up on hours of service. And so the beauty of what their maps and that are showing us here from CAB is that you're running in a corridor that's going to going to get you for hours of service. So it doesn't mean you're a bad carrier, it means that the territory you're running in has a you know, propensity to be that way. We have to look beyond that as an underwriter and say, does that make them horrible or does it just indicate they run in a very difficult area? Keep in mind also agents, you know, if they're running a pre-pass, you know, the states that they go through, how likely are they be able to get a pass and so they look like they're a good carrier in certain states and horrible in others. Well, again, it's knowing where they're running and what they're doing. So keep all those things to, in mind. And the point that Tiana wanted me to bring up, because we talked about it yesterday, you can see the triangle and the alert. And, and I looked at a carrier the other day that had not been doing their randoms. And so driver fitness has a, has a triangle and an exclamation point for a year because driver fitness may not have a number that blows them up over the line, but they came out, did a targeted or an on-site, and so that's going to sit there for a year. Well, that particular motor carrier also wasn't doing their DVIRs for their drivers, you know, the daily vehicle inspection reports, DVIR, and so likewise, they now have a triangle and an exclamation point sitting on their vehicle maintenance for a year. So you have to get behind this and understand what's going on. Thank you, Rich. And you bring up a very valid point. A serious violation will put a motor carrier into alert status for 12 months. And so keep that in mind. You can have a score below the threshold but still be in alert status because of a serious violation. And Rich brought up a very good point. Well, all right. I'm going to add one thing. We've got a time frame. When you use the term serious violation, that's what FMC does, but those are only when you have a non-rateable or a compliance review, officer goes and inspects. And if you look at some of the reasons that they will call a serious violation, it could be something as simple as you didn't keep your log book for six, for six months, and that could run up. So I don't even, I would even have a question, Tiana, about the term serious there, depending on what it is. It might be because we're using the wrong application. But you're absolutely right, and that's the concern you have here, is that stays there for a year even though you've corrected the problem. Exactly. And we put the serious violation in the alert section if you want to drill in and see what actually occurred. All right. Well, to Tommy's point, we, do, we are getting short on time, so we're going to...